Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the King. That is from the Epistle of St. Peter, which was read at the coronation service of King George the Sixth. I make it a text today because the death of one monarch is indivisible from the accession of the next. The king is dead. Long live the king. Has been an oft-repeated cry in the night through the centuries of British history. Only three times since England was one realm up to the present time have we announced the king is dead. Long live the queen. Though a third variation must have been heard on the death of Mary Tudor and a fourth on the deaths of Anne, Elizabeth and Victoria. The phrase carries with it all the clattering horses' hoofs, the clanging gates, the hurried whispers, the bright shouts, the lights and the darknesses of our island history. In a time such as this, our history feels very close to us, as close in spirit as our king has felt to us for the last 15 years, as close we pray as his mourning family feels that we are to them at this moment. Things ancient and modern seem to fuse as naturally in our national character and habitude as they do in the hymn book. And this is nowhere more stirringly evident than in the coronation service. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. And all the people rejoiced and said, God save the king. Long live the king. May the king live forever. Amen. Hallelujah. When our king was crowned, the peers of the church and the realm publicly did him solemn homage according to ritual. When that was ended, the drums beat and the trumpets sounded, and all the people in Westminster Abbey shouted together, crying out, God save King George! Long live King George! May the king live forever. As I heard it over the air, I remember thrilling to the almost savage beauty of it and being struck so forcibly by the amazing virtuosity of an institution wherein so archaic, so nearly barbaric a sentiment could fall so naturally beside the amiable practicability of our modern monarchical constitution. And I was caused to wonder at the vastness of what Mr. Churchill has described as the mystery that lies within the circle of the British crown. And I thought how lacking in perception that our national characteristics, to which belong the giant strength of this imaginative stretch, representing the marriage of the mystic and the practical, of poetry and prose, which is so harmonized in our idea of living and our ideal of conduct, should ever be referred to with so poor an expression of appreciation as British compromise. May the king live forever. The words are like a banner into which is woven all the mixed fabric, adopted and native, of legend and fact, that is forever fermenting in our national consciousness. It has the shrill of angel trumpets and the glint of jewels on an eastern tent. The dim grandeur of a Saxon chapel and the evening light on a soft green hill. The dark stain of blood. The cavernous blackness of coal mines. Salt spray and steamship funnels. The hackneyed crash of industry and the glowing majesty of William Shakespeare. Cool country lanes. Alehouse laughter. Oysters. Whelks. Firesides large and small and the ink-stained dustiness of commercial life. Permeating all, somehow, is the scent of daffodils. 
I fancy at our next coronation, the scent of daffodils will be all-pervading. But just now, and for some time, we mourn King George. We remember with what simple courage he assumed the burden of his unexpected duties. We remember the strange beauty which seemed to emanate from him during his coronation. We remember about this time, walking beside his clean, clear-cut human dignity, the enchanting graciousness and graceful majesty of his queen. We remember quite quickly the blessed consciousness that things were going to be all right. We got to know their children and to respect and delight in their family life. One parliamentary tribute reminded us the other day of the meaning of the word king. According to the Oxford Dictionary, it comes from the Old English kining, C-Y-N-I-N-G, which is a derivation of C-Y-N-N, which means kin, K-I-N. In short, one of us. We became strongly conscious that the king understood this ancient meaning during the war, when his courage, carriage, manner and behavior were an inspiration to us of the most glowing kind. He had all the kingly virtues, including that of a royal memory, as all who had the rare satisfaction of meeting him more than once can testify. He had tremendous industry and a conscientiousness in his work akin to fanaticism. He had perfectly the gift of mixing poetry and prose, in that he personified both majesty and humanity. He had also a shrewd and kindly wit, one example of which I will give you, if I may. Some artists were invited to paint pictures of Windsor Castle. One of these had developed the unusual but not uninteresting technique of painting all his skies black, or, or nearly black. When he was invited to tea a little later, the king said to him, I liked your picture of Windsor. Too bad you had such inclement weather. But regard, admire, praise, love, and hold him in homage as we did. It, is, it was not until he was failing in bodily health that the height of his spiritual stature appeared to us in tragically magnificent perspective. And our hearts were at once swollen with pride and wrung with anguish by his gallantry, fortitude, and courage. He was a king in the properest sense, for he reigned in the hearts of his people. Photographs which have appeared in recent days can leave little doubt of the love and loyalty that his people felt for him, or the grief that they now feel. Indeed, many of these pictures evoke what was written of William the Silent. While he lived, he was the guiding star of a whole nation. And when he died, the little children cried in the streets. The emotions of the last few days have brought forth a question which is being asked quite frequently. What does it mean to have a king? And how is it possible for whole nations to feel a personal sense of grief in the passing of one who must be for all except the very few, no more than a symbol? A symbol, moreover, which is immediately carried on, uninterrupted by death. I think I can express what is felt. The idea of a representative personage with the constitutional right to advise, born to his task and therefore entirely beyond the reach of party political influences, is very attractive and comfortable to us and invites us to believe in the possible ideal of a man in authority. Royalty has its own special inspiration along with its own special burdens. And we are immeasurably blessed that in the person of our queen we have so radiantly dedicated a being. To express a little more warmly our feelings for the monarchy, one could say that it is for us as though we had two families, our own and our royal family. And our royal family unites all our nations in a personal way which is dear and comfortable to us. The king is our father, the queen our mother, and their children our royal brothers and sisters. In the death of our king, we feel the dumb strangeness of a father gone, expressed in such perfect simplicity for us by our poet, 
He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. In grateful comfort, we now turn with love and loyalty to our gentle young mother, to whom we shall soon cry out loud. God save Queen Elizabeth. Long live Queen Elizabeth. May the Queen live forever.